Good morning. Thank you for joining me once again for our time together in the Word of God. We are continuing our study through the book of Genesis. Last time we began uh, chapter 3 of Genesis, and today we'll continue by looking at verses 7 through 13. We looked last time at the trap of temptation as Satan took on the form of a serpent and brought temptation and ultimately sin uh, into the lives and the world of Adam and Eve. Today we continue on by looking at the consequences of sin. If a young girl is sitting quietly at home reading a book and her little brother walks up to her and starts poking her, what's going to happen? There will be a reaction and it won't be good. If I sneak up on a cat and pour a cup of water on it, what's going to happen? There will be a reaction and it'll probably be funny. If I take a pin and poke it into a balloon, what will happen? There will be a reaction and it will be loud. Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion states, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. There are effects from every cause. Our actions will always bring about some sort of reaction. And this includes our sinful actions. Sin has consequences. The Bible's clear that the ultimate consequence of sin is death, eternal separation from God. Romans 6.23 reminds us the wages, payment, consequence of sin is death. This is what God told Adam the consequence would be if he were to disobey God and eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. In Genesis 3 verses 1 through 6 we saw that Satan lured Adam and Eve in with the trap of temptation and they disobeyed God's command and sinned. The moment they ate of the fruit, death was the consequence, both physical death and spiritual death. Because of their sin, this consequence of death has been passed on to all humans so that we are all born sinners, spiritually dead and in need of a savior. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Praise the Lord that God has provided the Savior that we need in the person of Jesus Christ, who took the penalty of death for us so that we might be forgiven. Death is the ultimate consequence of sin. But when Adam and Eve sinned, there were some immediate consequences of sin as well. Consequences that we still experience today when we sin. We see these consequences spelled out clearly for us in Genesis 3 verses 7 through 13, our portion of scripture for today. This morning we're going to see five consequences of sin found in these verses that were evident in the lives of Adam and Eve after they sinned in the garden. Consequences that are still evident today in the lives of human beings when we sin. The first consequence is found in verse 7, and it's shame. Verse 7 begins, Then the eyes of both of them were opened. When Adam and Eve sinned, immediately the knowledge of evil was added to their already existing knowledge of good. The time of innocence was over. The innocence referred to in Genesis 2.25 was gone where it says that they were both naked and were not ashamed. Gone was the bliss of innocent beauty, replaced with the burden of conscience. Now, after sin, the text says that they knew that they were naked and there was shame. They were acutely aware of their nakedness. They now saw themselves as the sinners they were, devoid of the perfect beauty that was theirs before sin. Their reaction was to try and cover their shame. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. 
they were right to be ashamed of their sin. Sin is shameful. And their sinful shame needed covering. The problem is that fig leaves were a woefully inadequate covering for the shame of sin. Their covering only covered the, the external problem. Sin needs the covering of salvation through Jesus Christ. As Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Shame was a consequence of Adam and Eve's sin, and rightly so. Sin should bring shame. Shame for sin shows that there's an understanding of the need for a covering for our sin. Sadly, we live in a world today that has mostly lost the sense of shame over sin. Closely related to the consequence of shame is the second consequence, the consequence of guilt. Verse 8 begins, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Evidently, visits from God were common and were surely something that Adam and Eve looked forward to until now. This really is a picture of love on God's part. Because he's God, he knew that they had sinned by disobeying him, yet he still came to them in grace and love, seeking them. God pursues them, giving them the opportunity to, to come clean, to confess and turn from their sin. But what did Adam and Eve do? Because they were guilty and they knew it, they tried to hide from God. When there's shame from sin, we try to cover it. When there's guilt from sin, we try to hide it. When I was a little boy, probably somewhere between the ages of two and five, I didn't like taking my vitamins. So when I didn't take them, I would throw them into the attic which worked just fine until mom went into the attic one day. I knew I was wrong, and I tried to hide my guilt. But just as I couldn't hide my guilt from my mom, so Adam and Eve couldn't hide their guilt or themselves from God. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Have you seen that T-Mobile commercial about playing hide and seek in the desert. It shows the foolishness of trying to find a place to hide in, a, in, a, in the open sand. That's how foolish it is to try and hide from God. The first consequence of sin is shame, which they tried to cover. The second consequence of sin is guilt, which they tried to hide. The third consequence of sin goes right along with the first two, and that's fear. Why do we try and cover our shame and hide our guilt? Because we know we are sinfully shameful and guilty, and we rightly fear the punishment sin brings and the one who brings the punishment. Guilt brings fear. That's why it says about government and law enforcement in Romans chapter 13, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Adam and Eve hid because of their fear of the righteous judgment of God. And that comes out in verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 gives us the first of three questions that God asks Adam. He asks, Adam, where are you? Now, God knew very well where Adam was. But in his grace and patience, God was giving Adam and Eve the opportunity to turn from their sin and turn to him. Instead of running from God, they should have been running to God. Adam's answer shows his shame and guilt and his fear of the righteous God. He said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. 
Adam says he feared God because he was naked, but in reality, he feared God because he had sinned. His sinfulness was exposed. Sadly, sinners run from God when we should be running to God. Praise the Lord that God seeks after sinners. The consequences of sin are so common, so predictable. Adam and Eve were ashamed because of their sin. They knew they were guilty when they sinned, and they were fearful of being caught and judged for their sin. It's good to feel shame and guilt when we sin, but our response should not be to hide from God, the God who loves us and is willing to forgive us. Our response should be to run to him and to his loving and gracious forgiveness. Now, in Adam and Eve, we will see a fourth consequence of sin, still a very common consequence today, and that is excuses. Still trying to get Adam to confess his sin and turn from his sin, God asks two more questions in verse 11. Who told you that you were afraid? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Again, God knew the answers to these questions, but he is still lovingly giving Adam the opportunity to come clean. While Adam does finally confess and say, I ate at the end of verse 12, he first of all plays the blame game and he makes excuses for his behavior. Who does he blame? He blames Eve and God. Notice, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. What's he saying here? Yes, I did eat, but it's your fault, God. You gave me this woman and she caused me to sin. Wow, now God has a question for Eve. What is this you have done? And she does the same thing that Adam did. The serpent deceived me and I ate. She admits that she ate, but she blames the deception of the serpent. Now, while it's true that Eve was deceived by the serpent, by Satan, and it's true that Eve gave fruit to Adam and then he ate, God still holds them personally accountable for their individual sin. Yet they try to put the blame on someone else. From a little child that tries to put the blame for wrong behavior on their brother or sister to an adult politician who tries to pin the blame for their bad decision on the other party, Excuses and the blame game have sadly become a normal consequence of sin. John Phillips writes the following in his commentary on Genesis. It's always somebody else's fault. The classic demonstration of that was at the Nuremberg trials where the Nazi war criminals were indicted for their crimes against humanity. Joseph Zeus, an administrative assistant, whimpered, A soldier can only carry out his orders. Walter Langelset, a battalion commander, declared, I was just a little man. Those things were done on orders from the big shots. Colonel Hose, commandant of the notorious Auschwitz concentration camp, who personally supervised the extermination of two and a half million Jews, explained, In Germany, it was understood that if something went wrong, the man who gave the orders was responsible. So I didn't think I would ever have to answer for myself. Hermann Goering, the former Reich Marshal and second ranking man in Germany, blustered, We had a Führerstadt. We had to obey orders. Hitler copped out by committing suicide, but no doubt he would have blamed the Treaty of Versailles. A confession of sin that makes excuses and puts the blame on someone else really is no confession. The consequences of sin, shame, guilt, fear, excuses, and finally, conflict. The sad commentary on sin is that sin does not create fellowship. Sin separates. In the case of Adam and Eve, a consequence of their sin was conflict and separation on two fronts. First of all, it brought conflict with God. When God came seeking fellowship, Adam and Eve hid. The peace, unity, and fellowship that they had with God had changed. Their sin had brought conflict, which resulted in separation from God. Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities, your sin have separated you from God. 
Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Sin brings conflict, separation, and broken fellowship with God. But it also brings conflict with others. <coughs> Excuse me. The text doesn't go into the details, but you can sense the conflict that was developing between Adam and Eve. Adam points his finger at Eve and blames her for his sin. The perfect harmony that they had in their relationship created by God was gone. As the text goes on and God talks about the curses of sin, <coughs> the fact of conflict with others becomes even more obvious. When we sin, it does not only affect ourselves. It can cause conflict with others. These verses record for us the first sin and the consequences that came from that sin. It's only the record of the first sin, but in reality, it's the record of all sin because we are all born sinners and we all sin because of this first sin. The consequences that came as the result of Adam and Eve's sin are the same consequences that we struggle with today. Shame and the attempt to cover our sin, guilt and the attempt to hide our sin, fear and the attempt to avoid judgment for our sin, excuses as we try to blame others for our sin, and conflict because of our sin. In light of the consequences of sin that we find in these verses, there's some very important truths for us to remember. First of all, we must remember that sin hurts. These verses remind us of that. First of all, it hurts God. God is holy and he cannot tolerate any sin. Psalm 5, 4 says, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. When his children sin, it hurts him. When Adam and Eve sinned, he had to be faithful to his word and bring judgment on them because of their sin. But can you imagine the sorrow in the heart of God because these two whom he loved so much had chosen to hurt the one who gave them life? Sin hurts God because he hates sin and he wants us to be separate from sin. Sin also hurts us. It brings shame and guilt and fear and excuses and conflict and separation and judgment. Our sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59 2 says, as I read earlier, but your iniquities, your sins have separated you from your God. For the unbeliever, that means separation from God for all eternity in hell. For the believer, that means a loss of fellowship with God in our daily walk. 1 John 1, 6 says that we can't walk in darkness and have fellowship with God. Nothing can hurt us more than being separated from God. We also must remember that sin hurts others too. Your sin never affects only you. Your sin may bring conflict with others around you. Your sin may cause harm spiritually, emotionally, financially, or physically to others. Your sin might cause someone else to sin, and your sin may turn someone away from God and his truth. Sin hurts. It hurts God, it hurts you, and it hurts others. In light of the fact that sin hurts, it's so important to remember, secondly, that salvation heals. Praise the Lord that God has provided healing for the hurt of sin. In salvation, God has provided healing for the penalty of sin, the penalty of death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's Romans 6, 23. In God's eternal plan, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God had already provided healing through his son, Jesus Christ, who would come to earth, live a perfect life, die a sacrificial death in our place on the cross, and rise again in victory over sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to be sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. <clears throat> 
The sin that separates the unbeliever from God can and will be forgiven and removed when the unbeliever becomes a believer. Turning from their sin and placing their complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for forgiveness and eternal life. Have you been healed from the penalty of sin? In salvation, God has also provided healing for the power of sin. The, the believer in Jesus Christ, who is still a sinner, still needs the power of the gospel in their life each and every day. The forgiveness of salvation provides forgiveness for all sins, past, present, and future. The believer finds forgiveness, healing, for sin when he confesses and turns from his sin as God instructs us. Do you know the healing of the gospel from the power of sin? <clears throat> In salvation, God will also provide healing for the believer from the very presence of sin. When someday the believer, either through death or the rapture, goes to heaven where there is and there never will be any sin. Praise the Lord for the healing power of salvation through Jesus Christ. Sin hurts, salvation heals, and we must not forget that sanctification is healthy. Sanctification is God working in the life of the believer in Jesus Christ to help them become more and more like Jesus. Until one day when we get to heaven, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. The believer in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, will make gradual and steady progress in their life, becoming more and more like Jesus every day. In this sanctification process, there are three important things that a believer in Jesus Christ must do. First, as we've already stated, the believer in Jesus must confess sin. The believer in Jesus has received forgiveness from the penalty of sin, past, present, and future. But as we continue to sin during the process of our sanctification, we must daily confess our sin to God and receive his forgiveness to maintain our daily fellowship with him. To confess means to agree, to see our sin the same way that God sees it, agreeing with him that we have indeed sinned against him and his word. It's the opposite of the excuses that we're so prone to make, as Adam and Eve did in the garden. When we confess our sin, we are promised the forgiveness that God has provided through his gift of salvation. Healthy sanctification means that we confess our sins to God. Healthy sanctification also means that we seek forgiveness. As I mentioned earlier, our sin hurts others. When our sin hurts others, and we know it, whether physically, spiritually, or in any other way, we must ask forgiveness from others if we're going to keep growing to become like Jesus. The Bible is clear that when a brother or sister in Christ sins against us, we have a responsibility as a believer to go to them privately and bring the sin to their attention so that they will seek God's forgiveness and your forgiveness. We find that in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. But even more important and better than this is the responsibility of a believer to go to someone we have hurt and seek their forgiveness. Matthew 5 talks about that. If believers were more sensitive to sin and more quick to go to others seeking their forgiveness for sin that it's hurt others, there'd be no need for this confronting believers about their sin because they would have already dealt with it. It's just another reminder that when it comes to sin, our first concern, our first responsibility is to deal with our own sin not point out other sins. Healthy sanctification means we confess our sins to God. It means that we seek forgiveness from others when we sin against them. And finally, healthy sanctification means that we pursue holiness. Simply put, holiness is the absence of sin. Jesus is the only person who ever lived on this earth who had no sin. So the only way that we will ever become more and more like Jesus is to pursue holiness in our daily lives. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 say, As he who called you is holy, 
you also be holy in all your conduct, because it's written, Be holy, for I am holy. We must pursue holiness in every area of our lives, our hearts. Spend time with God each day, growing in your relationship with Jesus by spending time in his word and prayer. Our minds. Fill your mind not with what the world has to offer, those things that we get constantly from the internet and TV and movies, but fill it with things that are pure and holy, like it says in Philippians 4 verse 8. Our actions. This involves the places that we go, the things that we do, and the people that we spend our time with. Our words. Our words are a reflection of what is in our hearts. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, the psalmist said in Psalm 19:14. <clears throat> as it says in 1 John, to be holy, we must walk as Jesus walked. Adam and Eve learned immediately in the Garden of Eden that sin has consequences. Shame, guilt, fear, excuses, and conflict. They also learned about the curses and judgments of sin that we will see as we continue in Genesis chapter 3. Our sin has consequences too. Remember, sin hurts. And ultimately, the only way to avoid the consequences of sin is to avoid the sin and be holy. And the only way that we can have the power to avoid sin is through the power of Jesus Christ. Salvation heals the hurts of sin and helps us on the walk of healthy sanctification. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for these opening chapters of Genesis that so clearly remind us of how it all began. And Lord, we know that we are all sinners because it started there in the Garden of Eden. And as we see the consequences that came there, we know that these are the same things that we wrestle with every day. So Father, help us to walk in fellowship with you by confessing our sins and, and seeking forgiveness and pursuing holiness. And Lord, if there's somebody who does not have a relationship with you that's listening today, May they turn from their sin and turn to Jesus and receive healing for their sin from the only one that can do anything about it, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for these truths. Help us to take them and apply them now to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. We will continue on in the book of Genesis next time. Uh, if you're available to come and join us right here at Faith Baptist Church, we meet at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings for our our morning worship time where we're studying the book of Genesis. Thank you once again for joining me. Goodbye.